and the rest of you guys, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 is our text this morning. I'm going to read from verses 5 down to verse 17. Hebrews 12, verses 5 down to 17. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My sons, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines whom he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are legitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping heads and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness for, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessings, he was rejected, for he found no chance to respond, though he sought it with tears. The way that we do preaching here at Loft is we, for the most part, do expository preaching. We go take books of the Bible and we start going verse by verse and studying it. One of the benefits and the challenges of that is that there will be times when we will have to preach on topics that otherwise we normally would pre never preach on. I mean, no one wants to hear about the discipline of God. No one wants to hear about us suffering. No one wants to hear about that. But because we go through these passages, we're forced to preach and study on these passages that God is speaking to us on. And let's face it, life is hard. It's difficult. If you don't think so, if you're young, just give it a bit of time, and you'll realize that as you grow, life is difficult. There's pain, there's hardships, there are difficulties that you experience. And the writer of Hebrews has been telling us that over and over and over again. The book of Hebrews is one of those books that you probably don't pick up on a consistent basis. It's not, and there's two reasons for it. One, it's full of ancient language, Old Testament imagery that's unfamiliar to a lot of us, things that we're not, we don't know, that we don't participate in, and so that kind of discourages us from picking up the book. The other reason is it's full of hardship and pain and suffering and agony and a group of people that are going through incredible difficulties in their lives. It's not something you probably reach for for devotional material. You'll probably grab stuff like Philippians that says, Rejoice in the Lord always, or be happy, or God's going to bless you, and things are going well. And you'd rather talk about happiness than suffering. But the book of Hebrews tells us that we're called to suffer over and over. We saw last week that faith in God sometimes produced miracles. Faith in God sometimes brought Goliath down. Faith in God brought mount, the mouth of lions to be shut. Faith in God cause deliverance and mountains to be conquered and all sorts of amazing things to happen. And we love that kind of faith because it's conquering faith. It's victorious faith. It's faith that takes you from victory to victory. And we enjoy that. We love that. But then the writer goes and says, faith in God sometimes means that things don't go the way you want it to go. Sometimes it means that you get sawn in half. I mean, hopefully none of us will experience that. But that's what happened to people that follow Jesus. Faith in God meant that you might be thrown in prison or ridiculed or mocked and no one will understand you. But all of this was part of faith. We don't like that. We want to skip over that. We'd rather talk about miracle and greatness and joy and happiness, how everything has a happy ending. But the reality is not everything does have a happy ending. That there are times in our lives that we experience pain and anguish and turmoil and that sometimes life doesn't make sense. The writer reminds us in Hebrews that we're called to suffer. And he begins chapter 12, and he says that your life is like a race. And the word that he uses for race there is the word 
in Greek that's translated agony. So it's, he's saying your life is a race, but it's not like a jog where you're smiling at everyone that's running alongside of you. And forgive me, but jogging and smiling for me doesn't make any sense at all, period. Running doesn't make sense at all for me, period. But he's saying it's not a jog where you're enjoying it. It's a marathon where you have to train and be disciplined. And at the end of the day, it's going to feel like you've been run over by something. It's going to feel like your, every muscle in your body is going to ache. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But it's going to be worth it. Our life has moments of agony, of pain. First Peter, Peter tells us that you've been called for something. And Peter, what have we been called for? What, are you, what have we as believers been called for? And here's what Peter says. He says, just as Christ suffered, leaving you an example... So you too must follow in his, in his example. You have been called to live a life that sometimes involves suffering. So it's important that you grasp this in your life, maybe now or maybe in your future, because there will be times in your life where things won't make sense. There will be moments of your life where you'll say, God, why is this going on to me? There will be moments of your life where you'll say, God, I'm following you, I'm obeying you, I'm doing everything you're calling me to do, but... Why is life hard? Why is life difficult? Why isn't things turning out the way I thought it would turn out? Why is it painful? And our writer is giving us perspective. Listen, if your idea of faith ends with David killing Goliath, or if your idea of faith ends with the mouth of the lions being shut, if your faith ends there, you're doomed. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be defeated because life doesn't always turn out perfectly. There are going to be times in your life that the lions will eat you instead of having their mouth shut. And yet, Faith says, I'm going to trust God no matter what happens to my physical body. No matter what happens around me, I'm going to trust that God knows what's best for me. And the writer is writing to an audience that's going through incredible hardship. We talked about this, but the church in Rome that he's writing to is a small group of believers, maybe 30, 40 people meeting in a house who love Jesus or following Jesus because they see that Jesus is better than everything else, but they follow Jesus and all of a sudden everything becomes horrible in their lives. Their family rejects them. Their friends have turned their back on them. The family business has been taken from them. The, they've been kicked out of the synagogue, which was just a place of worship. It was also a social place where you got together to hang out with people. The government has come in, taken their lands, their possessions, thrown them in prison. Life became hard and difficult for these group of people for following Jesus. Life isn't going well for them at all. And so we need to understand what's going on in their lives and then be able to apply it to our lives. Listen, because life, God doesn't follow your script and your plans for your life. He doesn't do things the way you want it to be done. Think about this church in Rome. They give up everything to follow Jesus, and I don't think they said, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus so that I can die for my faith. That's not probably what they thought. They probably thought, I'm going to follow Jesus, and God's going to bless me and take care of me, and all of a sudden, they're getting thrown in prison. It didn't go out the way they scripted it. Listen, you can't just trust God for your agenda. You've got to be able to say, God, will you give me your agenda and let me trust you that you know what's best for me? See, what these guys needed more than anything else in life right now was perspective. They needed a perspective of suffering. They needed their expectations set cor correctly. And don't underestimate how important perspective and expectations are. If you think about it, our expectations said appropriately, is where most of our battle lies in our faith. Half of the pain that you experience when you go through hardship and difficulty and turmoil in life is due to the shock, disillusionment, and the self-pity that you have that, man, this is happening to me? This is going on in my life? I'm following Jesus and this is what I get? I'm obeying God, and this is what I'm experiencing. That's half the battle, understanding perspective. But listen, we need more than perspective, right? I mean, it's nice to have good perspective, but we need more than that. We need to know that the things that we go through in life, the pains, the disappointments, the discouragements, that there's a meaning behind it, that it wasn't in vain, that it wasn't just by chance that things just happen, that there's a purpose behind it. And that's where the writer will go this morning to tell you that what you experience in life isn't meaningless, that God has a purpose and a plan for it, and it gives us proper perspective. What we're going to do this morning is really simple. The outline this morning, I stole it from a kid's book. I mean, it is so simple. Number one, God, God is our Father. Number two, 
we're his children. Number three, he loves us. Number four, we're part of his family. That's the outline. I mean, if you came for something deep this morning, I'm sorry. Come back next week. Um, But it's very simple. But hopefully this will encourage you that nothing that you go through in life is disappointing, is meaningless, that God has a plan behind it. Number one, God is our Father. Verse five, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines whom he loves, he chastises every son whom he receives. By the way, if it's important for you to understand this idea about the discipline of the Lord, most of us in this room hear that phrase, and we immediately think consequences for things that we have done wrong in our lives, right? That's what we think immediately. God's discipline in our life is not just reformatory. It's not just trying to correct us that God is bringing discipline because you sinned. It's more along the lines of having structure, having organization, at being organized in life. It's kind of like the idea that me telling my kids it's not good for you to have candy and a can of Coke for breakfast. They don't understand that. I do. They won't understand why I forbid them from eating candy and Coke from, in the morning. They don't understand it's not good for them, but I do. And so it's discipline saying, this is what you eat for breakfast. This is what's good for you. This is what's healthy for you. This is not healthy for you. You might not understand it right now, but listen, we do, and you've got to trust us. And in chapter 12, we see this imagery of this race and the idea of God being our coach. He's encouraging us. He's pushing us. He's telling us to run. And then all of a sudden, we get to verse 5, the verse we just looked at, and the imagery changes from God being our coach to God being our father. He goes into this whole spiel about God is our father. And that seems weird. Here's God. Here, we're in this race. We're running. We're running. God's our coach. He's motivating us. He's pushing us. And oh, yeah, by the way, he's your coach, but he's also your dad. He's your coach, but he's also your father. And you would expect God to be like your coach that's pushing you, but not your father. And the change in metaphor there is actually to help us because when you're going through hardships in life, and when you're going through difficulty in life, and when life doesn't make sense, it's not encouraging at that point to see God as a coach. But it's incredibly encouraging to see God as a father not just a father, a loving father. The image helps you process the situation which you're finding yourself in. And it says here that God, as your father, brings discipline into your life. And that sounds harsh. It sounds like retribution or payback or consequences or punishment, but that's not the word, actually. The word discipline there is the Greek word pedia, from which we get the English word pediatrics or pediatrician. So it makes more sense when you hear that God brings discipline. Think of the idea of pediatrician. A pediatrician is someone who looks out for the welfare, the health, the goodness of a child. Listen, sometimes a pediatrician has to draw blood, right? And he doesn't do it because he's mean to the child. He does it because he loves the child. Maybe he doesn't love the child, but he wants the child to be healthy. He wants the child to grow. The child will look at the pediatrician and he'll think, this guy is the worst person in the entire world. And he'll look at mom and dad and say, mom and dad, why are you letting this guy or this girl poke me with a needle? And he'll cry, he'll scream, he'll holler. But the pediatrician knows that this little momentary pain will bring good later. The mom and dad will allow the pediatrician to hurt the baby for a little bit just so that it could avoid sicknesses in the baby's life later. By the way, with first, our first child, Nicole, when she got shot, her first shots, I saw her cry. I wanted to hug her and embrace her. I'm like, man, don't hurt my baby. Don't touch my baby. The second one was a boy, so he handled it a little better. By the time we had Mike, I was like, ah, get over it. He can handle it. The other two got along fine. You'll be fine as well. So it changes perspective even over time of just thinking about how discipline is important. So here's this image of God, not just a father, but a pediatrician who's taking care of you who sometimes has to do things in your life that hurts, but he does it for your good. He brings necessary, non-destructive pain into your life for your flourishment and development as his children. Listen, there's two ways that we can respond to that, typically. We can either clam up or we can freak out. You can get all worried or you can get mad and yell. And there are the two responses that you typically have. And the writer says in our text that you can 
regard lightly the discipline of God or you can grow weary in the discipline of God. Let's look at those for a second. The idea there of regard lightly, it's a stoic response. It's the idea that you despise or disdain. It's the person who looks at suffering and pain and hardship and says, oh, this will eventually be over. I'll come over this. This won't phase me. This won't affect me. The macho man scenario. It's the kind of person that endures the suffering that has been brought into his life. They'll endure it, but they won't be happy about it. It's the kind of child that you try to discipline them, but they have that defiant look. They say, I don't care if you spank me. I don't care what you do to me. I, I'm just going to be defiant. I'm just going to stare you down, right? Um, you've seen children like that. But the other side is the child is the type of person that loses heart. This is the type of person that just freaks out and panics. This is a child that would be crushed under discipline. This is a child who takes any sort of discipline or correction, and they just fall apart, and they feel like they're failures. They feel like they're a loser. They feel like they can't get their act together. And this is the guy or girl that experiences suffering and pain. They have the ego experience. Um, woe is me. Woe is me. I'm a failure. I'm under the discipline of God. Woe is me. Life stinks. This is the person that does that. They're depressed. They'll give you a lot of, it's not fair statements. Life is not fair. There can't be anything good that comes from this experience. Nothing good is going to come out of this. It's the kind of person that will endure through suffering and pain and hardship, and they'll be depressed the entire time. These are two different responses, and sometimes we can jump from one to the other based on the situation, can't we? Sometimes we'll clam up. Sometimes we'll freak out. But God's goal is not to see our hearts hardened, and his goal is not to see us freak out. His goal is for us to experience his love for us. See, in verse 7, he says it's for discipline that we have to endure. He says that he's building us, he's strengthening us, he's training us for endurance to make us stronger. And in verse chapter 13, he says he's doing all of this so that eventually you can go out into the city and make Jesus known in the city that you live in. He is disciplining you and forming you and shaping you and working in you so that when you go out, you can be strong in how you make Jesus known in the community. One more thing, and let me say this real quick, and this will open up a whole can of worms, and I don't have time to dive into this, so if you have questions on this, you can ask me later. But some of us, we look at God, and we think that God somehow handed the world over to the devil and to our free will, and um, we just make a mess out of everything, and God is like Superman with a red cape, and he comes in and he saves us out of the mess that he created, out of the mess that we've made, and that somehow he comes to fix the mess that he somehow wasn't in control over. And that sounds good, right? It sounds great that God is our Superman, our Savior, our Deliverer. That sounds good, but if you think about that for a second... It, it makes God oblivious to what's happening in the world. That God isn't in control of it. That God doesn't know what's going on. And the text will not allow us to go there. The psalmist writes that the earth is the Lord's. Everything in it. It's not that there are things in life that take God by surprise. It's not that there's anything that can happen in my life or your life that God doesn't know about that he has to somehow come and miraculously deliver us from. If it's happening, and if we are his children, he's allowing it. And there's a reason he's allowing it. It doesn't shock him like it shocks us. It doesn't surprise him like it surprises us. It's the difference between like a surgeon who is planning a surgery and working to make someone better and an emergency room doctor who sews, up, sews us up after a freak accident. Two different perspectives. One is God is, our text is giving the idea that God is planning our surgery, not a doctor doing lacerations. He knows what he's doing. And what he does in our life is for our good, even though we don't understand it. The writer is saying that God is disciplining us, teaching us, correcting us, forming us, working in us. He has a purpose. He has a design. He has a plan for your life that what you go through, though you don't understand it right now, ultimately will be for your good, his glory. That God is working. I'm going to leave it there. You guys have questions on that? Ask me later. Number two, we are his children. God is our father. We are his children. Next verse, it's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, which all have participated, then you are illegitimate sons and not legitimate, legitimate children and not sons. The writer here is saying the reason that God is disciplining us is because we're his. 
We're his children. He cares about the development of his children. Listen, if we weren't his children, he wouldn't care about us and our development. Let me say something. Life might actually be easier if God didn't care about us. Maybe things wouldn't be so hard. Maybe things would be, go the way we want it all the time, temporarily, because we all realize that we're not just living 80 years, we're living for eternity. So it might be enjoyable for a season, but not forever. So here we find that God is loving us by bringing discipline. Think about it this way. Those of you who are parents in this room, or um, the parent who doesn't discipline his child, and whatever form that discipline takes, the person that doesn't discipline his children actually doesn't love their children. That sounds weird and countercultural, but it's the truth. The parent that doesn't discipline their child is more concerned about themselves instead of the good of the child. But God is not a passive parent that just sits there and lets you do whatever you want to do. He's actively involved. You ever been around a child that's not disciplined, that throws temper tantrums for everything, that demands everything that they want, and the parents just let them get whatever they want? It's irritating, right? But beyond that, it's sad. It's sad because it shows a lack of love from the parents because they're setting their children up for failure because their child is going to grow up thinking they can get whatever they want, whenever they want, and they're going to come to a point in life where they're going to realize that the world doesn't revolve around them, and they're going to face disappointment. And the parent lets them get away with it, and they think it's okay. And they get older, and they realize in a rough way that life isn't easy, that you can't just demand. They're, going to have a lot of, they're not going to have a lot of friends because they're selfish. They only care about themselves. And they're going to face a lot of disappointments. So they need structure and discipline and direction in their lives. And here's what God's saying. God's saying, I love you. You are my child. I am not going to leave you the way you are. I'm going to bring discipline into your life so that you can look like me. That's what he's saying here. He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. But listen, children don't just need structure and discipline from loving parents for the sake of their development, they also need it to understand that they belong, that they are meaningful, that they are loved. Because there's something that happens deep down in our soul if we have a father or a mother that just completely ignores us. I would rather have a father that's present physically than one that just completely ignores me. And even he might not be the best father and he might not have be able to parent perfectly, but I'd rather have one that is involved in my life than one that doesn't want anything to do with me. There's a deep wound that occurs if a parent is not around. And the text goes even further. It says that our suffering doesn't prove that God doesn't love us. It proves that God indeed does love us. He loves you. There are plenty of kids you look around and you wish that you could take them in and you can give them discipline and structure and um, direction in life. But, and you wish you could do that, but you don't do anything about it. I mean, you wish it for a moment, but then, and then it's gone, right? But if they're your child, you stick with them. You stay with them. You bring discipline to them. You love them. But you don't discipline another child, do you? That would be a bad thing. You'd end up in jail, right? I mean, you, but you do with your children. You, you discipline your kids. You love your kids. When it's your kids whom you love, you don't let them remain the way they are. You want, when you see your kid acting out, you discipline them because you love them. You want them to like you. You want them to be your friends. You want them to know that you care about them. But deep down inside, you know you can't just be their friend. You also have to be a parent, which means that sometimes you have to do things that they don't like. Sometimes you have to do things that are painful for them. Sometimes you have to do things that they don't understand. You give them structure and discipline to shape them into the man and woman that God wants them to be. You demonstrate in that process that they are your children that you love. That's why you do it. You aren't doing that with any other child. You only do that with yours. And they're not going to understand it at an early age. But eventually you do. But listen, even if you're a good parent... Even if you are a perfect parent, your child is not always going to understand why you do what you do, right? They'll think it's too much. They'll think it's too, too long. They'll think you're not fair. They'll think you're mean. And all of those words will come out of their mouth. Trust me, 
They'll come out of their mouths. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes it is too long. Sometimes it wasn't fair. Sometimes we were mean because we were responding out of our anger or hurt instead of really wanting to discipline our kids. We're not perfect parents. Sometimes when you have multiple kids, the wrong kids get punished for something that the other kid did, right? Uh, my brother got away with so much stuff because by the time my parents disciplined me, he somehow weaseled his way out of getting punished. And the wrong kid would get punished, right? I don't, I'm not looking for your sympathy or anything, but that's just reality. Um, but God, he's a father just like us, or a parent, but he's not like us. He's a loving father to his children who knows, all the, he knows us all the way down to the bottom, and he knows how to bring discipline and to structure to the degree that is just right in helping us build endurance so that we might be brought our greatest joy. God's discipline in our life is proof that we're his children. Let me be honest. Sometimes it feels the exact opposite, doesn't it? We feel that suffering is the opposite of love. We feel like going through pain and hardship and difficulty is not the love of God. It's the wrath of God. It's like, God, how can you allow this to happen in my life? How can you allow me to go through difficulties and pain? We feel like it's more of God's wrath than God's love. Do a Google image search on the wrath of God and all the images that pop up is this finger with lightning bolts coming at a person or at the earth. And that's the imagery that you have of the wrath of God. But can I suggest to you that if you look at Romans 1, the implication of the wrath of God is not God pouring his wrath out on us, but the wrath of God is God letting us go and letting us live our lives without him. That's the wrath of God. Let me read Romans 1, just a few verses there, from verses 18 down. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. But they reject God, claiming to be wise, they become fools. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. And listen, therefore God gave them up to in their lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature instead of the creator who is blessed forever. Listen again. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Again, and they did not see fit to acknowledge God. Therefore, God gave them up. Do you hear that? Three times in this one passage, God gave them up. That's the wrath of God. The wrath of God is God doing nothing in our lives. God not being involved in our lives. God saying, you want to go your own way? Go your own way. Do your own thing. When there's suffering in our lives, when there's pain and hardship, we can look to it as children of God and we can say that God is actively involved in our lives. He doesn't want us to remain the way we are. He doesn't want us to be the same way. He loves us enough to discipline us, to make us more and more like Jesus. Suffering, pain, anguish, disappointments is God forming us and shaping us so that we become more like Jesus. Listen, God letting me go my own way and letting me go and not being involved in my life is a much more scarier thought to me than lightning bolts. That God wouldn't care and be interested in my life. The indifference of God in my life. That's a scary thought. The wrath of God is not just God seeing something and attacking it. The wrath of God is God seeing something and saying, I'm not going to do anything about it. That's the wrath of God. So if you're his, and this morning if you're going through hardship and difficulty and pain, can I encourage you? God loves you. God loves you. God is not letting you go easily. He doesn't want you to remain selfish. He is stripping you off of idols in your life. He's not just treating you as slaves. He's not treating you as an enemy or a traitor or a felon, though it may feel that way. If you are his child, this is not how he is treating you. He is treating you as his child. He loves you. The question is, will you believe it? 
Will you trust it? And listen, God probably will not tell you why it's your turn and why things are hard and why this is happening to you and how long it's going to last and when it's going to get better. And God's not going to give you all of those answers. But remember, we see through the eyes of children. God sees through the eyes of a parent. And that leads us to the third point. God loves us. He's not just a father who just happens to have children. He's a father that loves his children. Verse 9, besides this, we've all had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirit, spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The first thing you notice there, pain, suffering, anguish is temporary. It's a short time. As a child grows up and leaves the home, he doesn't need discipline anymore, hopefully. So it is with the child of God. Because only in this lifetime do we need growth and maturity to happen. Paul writes to the Corinthian church that don't lose heart because even though your outer bodies are wearing away and wasting away, your inner self is being renewed day by day because this momentary light affliction, this momentary pain that you're going through, this momentary suffering that you're experiencing is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comprehension. And as we look to the things that are not seen but are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, they're here, there, today, and gone tomorrow, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The things that you're experiencing, and listen, who's writing this? It's Paul, writing in the midst of a prison, who's going through hardship and difficulty, and he's saying this momentary affliction is nothing compared to the eternal glory. So right now, no matter how old you are, whether you're 18 or 19 or 70 or 80, as a child of God, you still need discipline. God is going to bring non-destructive pain and suffering so that we might share in his holiness. Listen, God is more interested in you looking like him than he is in you being happy. He cares about your happiness, he does, but he cares more about you becoming more like Jesus than he does about meeting your selfish needs. God is more interested in your good than you are in your good. God is more interested in your joy than you are in your joy. I know it doesn't feel like that sometimes, but that's what our text is teaching us this morning. What God brings is for our good. And you know, we think we know what's good, right? Our parents tried and they fail miserably. Maybe we as parents, we try, we fail miserably. We do what seems best. But God always does what is best. Don't visualize God as like a magic sorcerer up in heaven creating potions and just dropping them down and seeing which one works. That's not God. He knows what's best. We do trial and error parenting. God doesn't. He knows what we need when we need it. We're the ones, if we're good parents, we have to apologize to our kids when we mess up. Listen, God doesn't have to apologize for a single thing that he does in our lives. He knows what is best. What he does and what he brings has a purpose, purpose, and it's perfect. He does it to strip us off of our idols that we think we absolutely need and we can't survive without, without those things. He loves us. He loves you. He loves us. Listen, everything difficult points to something more than our theory of life yet embraces. Think about that. When we see something as difficult in our lives, it's because it's attacking our theory of life. The script that we've written out, something difficult happens, and all of a sudden it feels like that script just got torn up and thrown away, and we freak out. Our theory of life, what life is supposed to be, gets disrupted. We had plans and dreams and goals and aspirations, and all of a sudden God comes in and he changes, changes those. Many times a difficulty or a pain comes to us and makes us question the idols that we have held up as the ultimate because God is interested in making us holy, not making us satisfied. He's more interested in us becoming like him than in us staying the way we are. He's more interested in your joy and your good and making you more like Jesus than he is about making you successful. He'll give you all of those things, but he's more interested deeper in changing your life. J.I. Packer, um, and this quote is in your, um, in your notes, it says, And still he seeks the fellowship of his people, 
and sends them both sorrow and joy in order to detach them from the things of this world and attach them to himself. You know, it'll feel like God is cruel at times. It'll feel like nothing good is going to come from trage tragedy. You think that you can't see any reason why this is happening in life, and if you can't see it, then there is no reason. But think about that reasoning for a second. You are assuming that you can see every reason for why things happen in your life, that you have perspective from every single angle. And the reality is you don't. Remember, we have the vision of children. God has a vision of a parent. We have the vision of creatures. God has the vision of a creator. We have the vision of finite people. God has the vision of an infinite being. And so if God is eternal, and he is, and if God is all-wise, and he is, and if God is omniscient, and he is, that means that a God who sees the end from the beginning, who is the author and the finisher of your faith, and their life that you only see a portion of, if God is all of that, then he has reasons that we cannot see or understand that are consistent with him being a loving father because he sees the end from the beginning. He knows what's good for you even though you don't understand it. That's what it means to be God. Verse 11, it says, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Here we have more of the love of the Father to us as his children. He says it will be painful, but it will be worth it. God's discipline is like medicine or surgery or physical therapy. You submit yourself to it. It isn't fun. It doesn't taste good. But you do it for the ultimate good of your health. Here it's saying that God is going to bring something better to your life because of it. And he isn't just going to bring fruit. He's going to bring peaceful fruit sweet fruit, the fruit of a changed life, the fruit of a Christ-like life. God will take out the chisel and he'll chisel away your stony heart and chisel away the things of your life that are not like him. And it'll be painful, but listen, the art that he creates at the end will be beautiful. It'll be worth it. That's what he's doing. He's disciplining us. He's shaping us. He's molding us. He's taking us through things that we don't understand at all. I shared this before. When we started Loft City, I had dreams, aspirations, and goals of what this church was going to look like, and, and God began to shatter those dreams. Came to a point in 2012 where I wanted nothing to do with this place. I was here showing up for the sake of showing up, and I felt like, God, I feel like nothing good is happening, nothing is growing, and God put me under the discipline and he was removing idols from my life, the idol of wanting to be a successful pastor, the idol of wanting to be a quote-unquote successful church, the idol of wanting to make a name for myself. And he started again to shatter it and shatter it and shatter it, and it was painful. And there were times where I just said, God, I don't want any more of this. I want to quit. And God kept shattering and shattering to the point where he started removing idols to the point that I said, God, whatever you may want to do, do it, but let your name be glorified through my life. And at that point, God began to start working and doing things where if I had quit two years ago, I never would have met most of you guys, never would have seen all of these things that God has been doing in my life. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's difficult, but you have to go under the hand of God and the chisel of God because what God is doing is for your good. And you might not understand it when you're going through it, but what he is doing is for your good. Number four. He's put us in a family to take care of us. God is our father. We are his children. He loves us. He puts us in a family. He hasn't left us here alone. And that's important to understand because all of the stuff we talked about before, they're individual. God is my father. God is, I am his child. He loves me. They're personal. They're individual. But now he's going to go corporate for a minute. He's going to help us see that he doesn't leave us alone to suffer. He puts us in the church. He puts us to suffer together so that we can help each other get perspective. Verse 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, but by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. The word strive there. The idea of pursue is to go passionately after it. He says, church, you are supposed to go hard after peace with one another. It's a corporate idea. Why is that thrown there? God's our father. We're his children. He loves us. Oh, yeah, by the way, be peaceful with one another. Why is that thrown there? You guys know how it is, right? Um, you ever been around someone that's hurting? Ever been around someone that's not doing well? Someone who's suffering? Someone who's going through a difficulty in life? It's hard. Sometimes in their pain, they'll attack you. Sometimes in their pain, they'll say things that will hurt you. They don't mean it, but they're going through stuff and hardship, and you just might happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, and you experience the brunt of their hardship. And that's what happens. And he's saying, when stuff like that happens, strive for peace. Be peaceful with one another. Sometimes in this agonizing race, there might be people that fall. And they might not be able to get up on their own. And it's incumbent on us as a church, as family, that as we run this race together, that when someone falls, that we don't just run by them and continue our race, but that we stop and we pick them up and we put them on our shoulders and we keep running with them, that we don't leave anyone behind. Because there will be times when you will fall and you will feel like you don't want to get up. And if you, you see people running by you, you'll get discouraged. And what you want in your life is you want someone to stop and say, hey, you can make it. You can keep going. You can keep striving. Listen, I'll help you. I'll help put you on my shoulder. You want that. And if you want it, listen, there are other people that have fallen that need it. So don't run by people that are hurting. Don't run by people that have fallen. Take them with you. And in the next couple of verses, he's going to say three things that we need to be looking out for when we're, as, when we're a church. Three things. We need to look out for quitting. You need to look out for bitterness. You need to look out for isolation. Listen, sometimes there will be people, when they experience the discipline of God and when they experience suffering and hardship and pain and turmoil, they'll want to quit. They'll want to give up. They want to raise the right flag. You guys ever been there? You just want to sit on the track and just sit there. You don't want to go anywhere. Listen, as a church, we need to be looking out for that. We need to be looking out for one another, especially people that we see are slowing down. That's what we're supposed to do as a church, as family. This is why God gave us the church, so that when we go under discipline of the God, that we may have people to help us so that we don't quit. Listen, guys, bottom line, you will never grow, you will never survive apart from the church. If you think you can survive in this agonizing race, in this life called the Christian life by yourself, it's not going to happen. You can't make it alone. You need the church. Sheep don't, serve, sheep don't survive apart from their flock. The second thing he says is look out for bitterness. Watch out for poisonous people. Here's how it works. You have a person in the church who looks at their suffering and pain, and they, they go, I deserve better than this. This is not what I signed up for. This sucks. I thought when I came to Jesus, life was going to be so beautiful and things were going to be great, but life is hard. I deserve better than this. And then you start taking it out on other people, and you take it out on the church, and you take it out on God. You become a bitter person. And it spreads from one person to the next. Do you realize that when you're suffering and you don't handle suffering well and you start attacking people around you and you start pushing people away, do you realize that it's not just about you, but when you do that in your individual suffering, you uh, let it affect the entire church, you hurt all of us? You hurt everyone. Because we're part of one body. We're not separate people. We're one body. And when you are bitter and when you are hurting and you don't allow the rest of the body to minister to you, you affect the whole church. We're family. And for you to suffer and push us away is causing all of us to suffer. But this is what it means to be a family of God. So we got to watch out for bitterness. 
It's a horrific disease of the soul. And when you get bitter, you start looking for ways to make people unhappy around you. You got to watch out for that. And if you're there, you need to repent and you need to come to people and say, listen, I'm bitter. I need help. Pray for me. Encourage me. Push me along. I feel like I'm doing this and I'm, nothing's going and my heart is getting hard and I can't do this alone. Find people around you. And the third thing he says is watch out for isolation. This is where that whole Esau story comes around. Esau was a perfect example of someone who gave little regard to family. He didn't care about his family. In fact, he sold his birthright because he regarded his family as nothing. He moved out of his home and lived in isolation and ended up in unholiness. Listen, it's dangerous when you're alone. Isolation leads you down a spiral a downward spiral. You know how this works, right? You get isolated. You get lonely. You start to suffer. Things get hard. Here's what you do. Man, I'm hurting. Man, I'm tired. Man, life is difficult. I'm just going to go and I'm going to go sin. You might not say sin, but you're going to go find something pleasurable to do that it hurts your relationship with God. You might not have that logic, but that's what you do. You look for something to do to make you feel better than where you are right now, and so you reach for idols out there. It happens all the time. And it never works, right? It just brings you sorrow and pain like we see in Esau's life. Guys, Satan's strategy is to get you isolated. Because when you are isolated, you're easy picking. To get you detached from church, to get you detached from community, to get you detached from the family of God is always his methodology to attack you. You start suffering, and because you're isolated, instead of running to the church to walk with you, you start blaming the church and the people in the church. You say things like, no one else will ever experience what I've experienced. No one else will ever understand what, I've under- what I'm going through. No one else cares about me. You start assuming things about people. You assume that certain looks means that people don't want anything to do with you or they don't like you. I saw how they looked at me, right? And, so, and then you start isolating yourself with people. You start assuming that the pastor says something on stage and you immediately assume that he's talking about you. He's taking shots at you. By the way, I'm never talking about an individual up here. If you feel that, it's probably the Holy Spirit, okay? It's not me attacking you. First Peter 5, Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a lion, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's a lion. He's seeking someone. What does a lion do when he's hungry? Does he go after the entire herd? He doesn't. He sits, he waits, he watches for that one that leaves the herd, goes off on their own. And when that person, that sheep or whatever it is, is isolated by themselves, the lion will pounce all over it. He waits till they're isolated. That's what the devil does. He tries to isolate you, making you assume things about people that aren't true, making you assume that people are thinking about you in ways that they aren't thinking about you, making you think that the world is against you, the church is against you. He tries to isolate you. And you need to be weary, mindful of that. And instead of allowing people to step into your life and help you, you run out by yourself and all by yourself, and the enemy attacks you and destroys you. This is what happens. Let me say two things on that. If you are isolated, you need to be in community. You need to let people know that you're hurting. Because we cannot assume and know everything that's going on in your life. You need to say, I need help. The flip side of that, church, if you see people walk in here and they're alone and they're not talking, you need to make every effort to love them, to embrace them, to get to know them, to welcome them as family. They're not friends. They're brothers. They're sisters. They're family. We don't need cliques in here. We need to be family. We don't need one group here and one group there and someone shows up and they don't know where to go. We need to be family together. We're family. You are my brother. You're my sister. I need to take care of you. You need to take care of me. We are family. No one goes isolated. This isn't profound theology, and you've heard this before. God loves you. 
God loves you. No matter what's happening in your life right now, no matter what you're going through, you need to know that God loves you through that. He's bringing non-destructive pain because he loves you. I know it feels destructive, but listen, it's for your good to mold you and shape you into the person that God is calling you to be for his glory, for your good. He's more interested in your joy than you are. Listen, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that you're going to understand all that you're going through. It doesn't mean that you'll have an answer for everything you experience in life. But one thing is very clear, and one thing that you can never say in your life is that God doesn't love you. And that's why this is happening. You know why that is? Because God isn't indifferent to us. God is not passive. You know how we know? We know by looking at the cross. The one thing that is very clear when we see the cross is that God loves us. Because at the cross we see that God is not passive, but he actually comes down. He suffers in our place. And there is a statement that Jesus makes on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what happened at that moment on the cross? At that moment, Jesus became sin for us. And the father who had an eternal relationship with his son that never broke, was always full of joy, always in communion, always in relationship. At that moment, the father turns his back on the son. For the first and only time in history, the father and son's relationship was broken. Why? Because the father couldn't look on sin. His son became sin for you, for me. He lost the relationship with the Father for a moment so that he can bring us into the family. And the Father lost the relationship with the Son for a moment so that he can call us children. So he can call you the son and the daughter of God. That's what he did. So you cannot say that what you're going through is because God doesn't love you. He loves you. You are loved by God. And what you experience in life, whether now or in the future, is for your good. He will never abandon you because Jesus was ultimately abandoned for you. God is a father. You are his children. He loves you. He's put you into his family. He cares about you. In a moment, we're going to be celebrating the table together. And the table is a reminder that he loves us, that he loves you, that he gave his life for you. The way we celebrate the table here at Lost City is we encourage you to meditate on the word as the worship team plays. Let God and the Holy Spirit deal with your life. And if there's things that you need to repent of, would you repent? And whenever you're ready, You're welcome to come and grab the elements from the table and bring them back to your seats. And I'll come back up here in a few moments and we'll partake of the table together. But this table represents the body that was broken for us. It represents the blood that was shed for us. It shows us that God loves us enough that he wouldn't just be passive and watch us, but he would come down and he would intervene to save you, to make you sons, to make you daughters. You pray with me. Father, life is hard. Maybe there's people in this room this morning that they're experiencing incredible hardship right now. I pray that you would remind them that you love them, that you have them in the palm of your hands that nothing happens unless you allow it. And if you allow it, you have a purpose for it. It's so easy to look at life and think that this 40, 50, 60 years is all there is, but help us not to forget that we are being molded for eternity. That death is not the end of this but we get to spend eternity with you. And that what you're doing in our lives now is for ultimate good. 
And so, God, for my life, I say, even though it's painful, help me to trust you. Help me to know that what you're doing is for my good. It's for your glory. Help me to know that nothing in life is wasted, but that you have a plan for it. You have a purpose for it. Help me to know and believe that you're a good father who is taking care of his children. As we come to the table, we pray that you would reveal those things in our lives that are not like you and help us to repent and rejoice that you have forgiven us and help us to trust you with our lives. We love you. Let's worship you.